Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have challenged us and refreshed us with the wordings of the song that we have heard. O oh Lord, we pray that all that you have ministered to our hearts will do us permanent good in Jesus' name. We pray that in the brief moment we have with you and with one another now, you will challenge our hearts again. Prepare us for the days ahead of us. Bless us, O oh Lord, and bless other people through us, even as we are in this conference in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered, for we pray in Jesus' name. Formally, I want to welcome every one of you. And I praise the Lord for your being here. I believe that your being here will do you good. Do you believe that? I know that none of us is here by accident. This step you have taken is one step in the process of the salvation of many people. This conference could be for you what Pisgah was for Moses. It could be for you what Mount Carmel was for Elijah. Or it could be for you what the Mount of Transfiguration was for Peter. Or what Pentecost was for the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Depending on your preparation, depending upon your expectation, depending upon your participation and cooperation with the Holy Spirit as you are here, He can show you the whole span of the promised land from this place. And it can bring heaven's fire upon the altar of your heart from this place. Or it may give you an exalted vision of Christ like the had on the Mount of Transgression. And it can empower you for the task of many years from this conference. This is what we are believing it will do for every one of us. And I pray none of us will be disappointed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need a clear vision. We need a fresh anointing. If you look at the ministry of Moses, it started with a vision of the unburnt, burning bush. And he ended with the vision of the promised land as they viewed it from the mountain top. And how could he have faced everything that he faced in Egypt and with Pharaoh without the vision that he saw. And if you think about it, do you think you can face all that you need to face in the ministry without seeing a vision from the Lord? Think about Daniel. He knew God. And he kept the vision of the Almighty God before him in a land of impotent gods of gold. Do you think he could have faced everything that he faced? Do you think he could have survived everything that he survived in that land of Babylon, in the lion's den, without the vision of the Almighty that he saw? Think about Paul the Apostle. His ministry started with a vision of Christ, and it ended with the vision of his reward in heaven. I don't think he could have endured everything he endured. He wouldn't have been able to preach so often. He couldn't have been able to write all the many epistles he wrote or asserted his life in such dangerous situations of missionary journeys without all the things that he saw. I pray that God will make you see enough here that till the end of your ministry on earth, you'll never be discouraged. You'll never be downtrodden. And you'll be moving on until the very end in Jesus' name with a clear vision and a mighty anointing from on high will be confident to do everything that the Lord wants us to do. That's why briefly tonight, I want to challenge you and speak to you on the necessity of a fresh anointing and a clear vision from above. In Proverbs chapter 29, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Lamentation chapter 2. Lamentation chapter 2. Verse 9 and then verse 
14. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Verse 14, Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. They have not discovered thine iniquity, to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee false burdens and caused causes of banishment. Linking these two passages in Proverbs and Lamentation, you will see how terrible it is for a land to have ministers of the gospel that have no vision from above. And if we knew the truth, we will know we cannot go any step further in our ministry without vision from above and without a fresh anointing from the Almighty God. That's why I believe it has been necessary for us to call ministers of the gospel together at this time so that we'll pray unitedly that God at this time will give us a vision of himself once again. And not only that, he will give us a vision of himself once again. He will give us a mighty anointing to carry out the vision. All the period you will be here this week, you will listen to messages from ministers of God, servants of God. You will listen to seminars and workshops. We will interact together. There will be question time. We'll fellowship together in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we see. There will be one thing uppermost in your heart that as you see, as you hear, as you learn, as you pray, that God will show you vision from above. And if you will pray like that and mean it, if you will pray like that and really believe, he will show you himself. He will reveal himself to you more than ever before. But you see, the anointing without, or the vision without the anointing, will not be able to accomplish much. As we are praying that God will reveal more of himself unto us, we'll be praying that God will anoint us afresh once again. So that after we have left this place, we'll be able to say, we have seen a new vision. We have got a new anointing. And no matter what we are called upon to do, after we leave this place, of the vision and the anointing, I believe we shall never fail. As I talk about vision, let me briefly talk to you on the necessity of vision in seven different areas. In fact, I believe, according to the revelation of Scripture, that no apostle, no prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, no minister of the gospel can do much today without a clear vision on these seven areas I'll be showing you from the Word of God briefly tonight. And as we're here all through this week, it should be the desire of your heart. It should be the agony, the anguish. It should be the prayer, the desire of your heart that, oh Lord, in all these seven areas, give me a vision. And in his own way, in his own way, he will give you the vision that you ought to see. And then after that, give me an anointing that I'll be able to carry out all that you want me to carry out. Number one, we need a new vision of God. A new vision of God. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Significant passage of scripture. A king, earthly king, died. And Isaiah needed to see the great king of glory. You see many times in your ministry you will discover that the kings on earth do die. Supporters do die. People of power, people of wealth, people of might, people of legal understanding, people of authority 
they do die. There comes a time in your life where the king, Uzziah, will not be able to help you. He's gone and he's not coming back here. But you're still alive. And you're still facing all that you ought to face for the ministry. And no matter what King Uzziah had promised you, or the confidence you had that as long as King Uzziah is there, all the permission I need, all the authority I need, everything will be all right. But now King Uzziah has died. Isaiah needed a vision of the Lord. And he said, I saw also the Lord. If we stopped there, you might have even got enough. Think about it. If Pharaoh had revealed himself to Moses in all his cruelty and wickedness and fury before Moses saw the Lord, that man would never have been able to do anything. What if all that Elijah could see was Ahab, the wicked king, and also the terrifying or the other fellow, Jezebel, and he didn't see God, he will never have been able to do anything. What if the servant of Elisha, all that he had seen was the army that came from the king of Syria, and he never saw the chariots of heaven, he never could have been able to do anything. You know that David was running about all the time, because this man Saul was after him. What if he didn't know the Lord? The Lord is my shepherd. What if he did not know that? What if he did not know that the Lord is my refuge, my fortress? In him will I trust. What if all he saw was Saul? He will never have been able to do anything. Go with me and think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As they faced the fury of Nebuchadnezzar. What if all they knew was the power of Babylon? What if all they knew was the magic of the magicians? What if all they knew was the cruelty of Nebuchadnezzar and they did not know their God? Think about Daniel. What if he did not know God? The people that know their God, they'll be strong. They will do exploits. What if all these people had not seen God in vision and they had seen him in his majesty and his glory and all they could see was just the powers that be, the powers of the kings of the world? they will have not been able to do anything. Think about Jesus Christ. My Father who sent me is always with me. I saw the Lord on my right hand side. And he said he was never, never, never alone. What I see the Father do, that I do. What if the apostles and the disciples of the Lord in the early church, they did not know the Lord and see the Lord and taste his power. You need a vision of God. Many of us are fearful because we have not seen a vision of God. Many of us are discouraged because we have not seen a vision of God. Many of us feel, how can I go ahead? What can I do now? Because we have not seen the vision of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Sitting because it's a God of majesty. It's a God of power. And it's a God who had settled the history of the world from the beginning of the world. He's never afraid because there's no other God beside him. Many times we, his children, we do not know enough of our Father. We do not see him enough. Because of this, there is fear in our hearts. When you look at all the kingdoms of this world and their threatenings, but I pray that at this conference, you will see the Lord. In his majesty, in his greatness, in his glory. Once you have a vision of the Lord, even if you saw the devil himself personified after that, you can never be afraid. You have seen the sovereign one, the greatest one, the highest one, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And it doesn't matter who is the one that is ruling in your community or in your state. You see the Lord. It wouldn't matter whether you see Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or Herod or Pilate. After that, all you see, all you need is a fresh vision of the Lord. And then he said in verse 2, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Isaiah saw the Lord, 
he also heard the shouting and the praises of the angels of the Almighty God. And he said, the Lord is holy. How that must have impressed something upon Isaiah, that God will never be unfaithful because he's holy. How that, God must, how that must have impressed something upon the heart of Isaiah, that he will never fail and he will never compromise. He will not be on the side of the enemies of righteousness because he is holy and the whole earth is full of his glory. You need to think about for some moment about that. You see many people do not know that the whole earth will be full of the glory of God. They think that there is a spot on the face of the earth where God will never be able to get glory. They think there are traditional worshippers somewhere where you will never be able to penetrate and God will take the glory. They think there are some fanatical religious people somewhere that will so hinder the preaching of the gospel and God will never be able to get the glory. They think there are some persecutors somewhere that are so furious and that will hinder your ministry that God will never be able to get the glory. But do you know and do you understand that the whole earth is full of the glory of God? What if you woke up every morning and you saw your house full of the glory of God? What if you woke up every morning and you saw your church community filled with the glory of God? What if everywhere you go, whatever may be happening, all of a sudden you don't see the devil anymore, you do not see the enemies anymore, you do not see all the difficulties anymore, all you see is that all that community is full of the glory of God. It will put something in your spine. It will put courage in your heart. You'll never turn back or you'll never look back. But you need to know and you ought to know that the whole earth, whether here or there, in the jungle or in the city, anywhere you are called upon to minister, the whole earth is full of its glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What I want to tell you from that verse is that anything that needs to be shaken will be shaken. Anything that needs to be moved will be moved. Whether they need to be moved out of the way, for you to be able to do what the Lord wants you to do, His voice alone will shake everything that needs to be shaken. The point is this, we need to have a vision of God Himself. Not only that, number two, we need to have a vision of God's suffering people. You may have a vision of God, but you may not be able to really reach out to people if you do not know, if you do not have a vision of God's suffering people. In Exodus chapter 3, from verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, but, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When Moses looked at the bush, it was a common thing, a common sight to a shepherd, to a farmer. When you look at the people of God today, they look like a common lot. They look like ordinary people. Another thing that Moses saw is that when he looked at this ordinary bush, he saw something that happened, that fire was burning. Again, there was nothing too spectacular in the fire burning at the backside of the desert. Normally in the desert, fire ought to burn. And when you look at the people of God today, they are not, uh, you know, highly placed, or most of them. And they are not people that command uh, majesty or glory when you look at them ordinarily. They, are, they appear like just, like just the bush. 
And then when you see that the fire is burning, it may, it may be the fire of affliction, the fire of hunger, the fire of persecution, or whatever it may be. But then the extraordinary thing that Moses saw is that the bush was burning, but the bush was unburnt. The bush was burning, but it was not consumed. Think about that. When he got to Egypt, he saw that the fire was still burning. When he left Egypt, he saw that the people of God were under oppression. He saw that they were being persecuted. The affliction was terrible. Maybe he felt by now those people, Pharaoh was so bad, he would have maybe wiped them out. But then when he got back, he saw that Aaron, his brother, was still alive. That bush has not been consumed. Miriam was still alive. That bush had not been consumed. There were even elders on all the 12 tribes of Israel. That bush has not been consumed. And he saw the people in Goshen. Oh yes, the affliction was there. The rigor was there. The difficulties were there. But the bush had not been burnt. Had not been consumed. That must have given him something within what he saw. And eventually gave him the courage to go and confront Pharaoh. Let my people go. You know the answer. Pharaoh said, no, I'll burn them up. The fire will consume them. But Moses must have been remembered. Even though this man is fuming and is uh, shooting out uh, arrows and firebrand and smoke, whatever, he knew that the bush will never be consumed. It may be that from where you have come, the little congregation you pastor, or maybe the large congregation you pastor, there is fire burning. I pray God will show you a vision. That even though the fire may burn, the extraordinary thing is that people of God are never burnt up. We are not meant for the fire. We are meant for fellowship with God. And you see the people of God, there may be affliction. There may be persecution. There may be difficulty. There may be opposition. There may be whatever the devil may want to bring up. But the people of God will never be consumed. I want you to spend time during this conference in prayer that God will show you that the children of God will never be burnt up. They will never be consumed. And you, you are part of the people of God. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, if you have fellowship with the Lord, whatever fire may be burning in your family, whatever fire may be burning in the ministry, whatever fire may be burning all around you, thank God it will never consume that bush. We will see the Lord face to face on the last day in Jesus' name. Number three, we need a vision of heaven. You see, when you are running a race, you need to see the goal ahead of you. Otherwise, you might be fighting as somebody beating the air. Otherwise, you might be running as somebody without a goal. But we need a vision of heaven. Why do some people backslide? They don't have any vision of heaven. Why do some people leave the ministry that God has given to them? They do not have any vision of heaven. Why do some people say, I don't think I can continue. The thing is too much for me. The ministry is too hard for me. Because they do not have a vision of glory. A vision of heaven. One, you need a vision of God. And you need it fresh. Two, you need a vision of God's sovereign people. And you're calling to be of help to those people. Number three, a vision of heaven. And of the glorified conquering Christ. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. From verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. And he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Some people have been wondering, how could Stephen go through all that stoning? You too could go through if you saw heaven. If you saw Christ glorified. If you saw him high and lifted up. If you saw Christ standing on the right hand side of God. If the windows or the doors of heaven are opened. And you see far into heaven. And you see those pearly gates. It will give you strength for the labor ahead of you. It will give you courage for all the trouble you are going through. All we need is a vision of heaven. Whenever you are tired, go back into the closet and tell the Lord to show you the glory that is ahead of you. 
What I, when, whenever you are getting discouraged and downtrodden, and it appears that you want to give up, go back to your closet again and say, Lord, I need a vision of heaven. That's why the people were able to carry it through. That's why the people were able to be sustained in all the difficulties and the trials that they faced. And eventually you can see what the man said in verse 56. He said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. You know what they called him? They said he was fanatical. You see, those who don't have any vision, they'll be cold. The people that see, have visions of the Lord, of God's sovereign people, and of heaven, they will call us fanatical. Your testimony will seem extraordinary, out of the way for them. They will not be able to understand. And you see, after they ran upon him, they began to stone him. What do you think a man like that will do? If you don't have any vision, you'll feel the pain. But there's something that vision does for you. You don't know they're even stoning you. You don't even know you are going through anything. Once you have seen the vision of God, the vision of heaven, and the vision of God's sovereign people, and you know you are called upon to take all these sovereign people to heaven, you will not even know that they are stoning you. So number one, we need a fresh vision of God. Number two, we need a fresh vision of God's sovereign people. Number three, we need a fresh vision of heaven, the glorified, conquering Christ. Number four, we need a fresh vision of the ultimate collapse of earthly kingdoms. If you see the kingdom of God in a visionary form, you also need to see that the kingdoms of the world will eventually collapse and be demolished. If you add that vision, you will not give your life to building up a kingdom that will soon be destroyed. You see many people, they say they are ministers of the gospel. And they leave the work of the kingdom. And they try, they start building another kingdom. A kind of kingdom that will soon collapse. They don't understand. They ex they're exchanging something real for something that will not last. But you see, think about the people in the Bible. Let me talk about Moses once again. He had the privilege to become a prime minister in Egypt. He rejected it. Why? The Bible says because he acted as seeing him who is invisible. Once you have seen the invisible that other people cannot see, you will follow a different direction. You will be following a different thing. Think about Elijah. Think about Elisha. And think about Daniel. When he said the people should not pray, they should turn, they should talk only to the earthly king. They should not pray to the almighty God. That man had seen the vision of God. And he had seen the vision of the collapse of earthly kingdoms. He prayed. And of course, he was thrown to the lion's den. But he remained there alive and came out without being hurt. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. You'll read later on your own from verse 31. But let me read to you from verse 36. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, has he given into thine hand and has made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, another and another third kingdom of brass, which shall be a rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, Shall it break in pieces and bruise, and where art thou stores the feet of and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in need of, of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sowest the iron mixed 
was a muddy clay, and as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with clay, thou shalt they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another, to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, the interpretation thereof is sure. The kingdoms of this world will collapse. All the world, all over the world, and Christ will reign wherever there is sun. And do you know at that time he will say, because you have been faithful, over a few things have rule over five cities, over ten cities, over two cities, and you will rule with the rod of iron. The people that go away from the ministry is because they have not seen the vision of this kingdom of the world collapsing. Think about Judas Iscariot. I'm sure he didn't see this vision. Think about Demas that loved this present world and he turned back and went to Thessalonica. It's because he never saw the vision. But you see, uh, Paul the Apostle, he saw the great vision. And he said he saw things in the third heavens which he couldn't talk about to mortal men because those things were too deep, too great for him to talk about. Once you see that our Christ will reign forever and forever, Whatever little problem you have, you will endure a little more. A little more. Because you know, very soon, all the kingdoms of the world will be destroyed and Christ will reign forever and ever. Number five, we need to see a vision of multitudes on their way to hell who can be rescued if we'll go to help them and to speak to them. We need, as we see the vision of people, just passing by. Many people see multitudes passing by, but they never see them as helpless people, people that are on their way to hell, and people that we could rescue, we could help. But once God shows you the real vision, and you see people not walking as trees, but you see them as never dying souls, as perishing people, as people that you can rescue, you will never be the same again. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Not to you as you read this, you may say, this isn't a vision. Because, uh, you know, the people were so many, and they were passing by. And Jesus saw them. Oh, yes, my friend, it's a vision. You know why I said that? Peter saw the same people, but he never saw the vision that Jesus saw. James and John and Matthew, they saw all these same people, but they never saw what Jesus saw. The politicians of the day, the Herodians of the day, and the Herodians of the day, and the zealots of the day, they saw the people, but they never saw what Jesus saw. And even the, all these Pharisees and the scribes, they saw the people, but they never saw what the people saw, what Jesus Christ saw. You know, when you go to the stadium, for example, you may see a lot of people. The footballers see them too, but they never think about them as perishing people. They see them as people that have come to look at them, spectators. When um, lawyers see them, they don't see that they are never dying souls. They see another thing because they see a lot of these people must have cases and I have to make my cards available so I'll be a consultant. When engineers saw, see these people at the stadium, what they'll be thinking about is, is this stadium strong enough to bear all these people? They never see any vision. 
But if you saw the same people, if God doesn't give you a vision, you will see them like a lawyer will see them. You will see them like a doctor will see them. You will see them like a salesman will see them. When God gives you a vision and you see the cars that are passing by, and you see the multitudes of people in the market, once God touches your heart and touches your eyes, you will see a real vision of the multitude that if you do not rush in immediately to save them, they are likely to perish. Number six, we need to see a vision of the judgment day. Once you see a vision of the judgment day, I don't think you will ever be careless in your life. Once you see a vision of the judgment day, every step you take, everything you do, you'll be very, very thoughtful. And the ministry that God has committed into your hand, you will do it with all your strength. You will put everything you have into it because you will say, I saw the vision of the judgment day. In Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in each, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whenever you, if you have seen a vision like this, whenever you see people, something that will strike in your heart is, has his name been written in the book of life? Anytime you see people, the question that will occur to you, is he born again? Anytime you see people, the thing that will occur to you, if he should die now, will he be lost forever? But because many people have not seen a vision like this, oh yes, they have read about hell, but God has not burnt that message into their hearts. They have not really seen a vision of the judgment day. Whenever they see people in their church who are not born again, all that they do is that they just entertain them or they tell them to come again. They really do not know that these people might die before the next meeting, before the next service, and they could be lost forever. But when God has shown you a vision of the judgment day to come, you'll preach a different message. You'll have a different zeal. You'll have a different attitude. When you see rich men, you'll not be thinking about their money. You'll be thinking about their soul. When you see educated people, you will not be thinking about their certificate. You'll be thinking about their soul. When you see men and women, you will not be thinking about what they can do for you. You'll be thinking about what you can do for them. We need a vision of the day of judgment. And when that vision is very clear, then we'll be able to reach out and really help the people. Number seven, we need a vision of self. Who we are, what we are, where we stand in the presence of God. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse, verse 5. Then said I, woe is me. I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Before this time, Isaiah was a preacher and a prophet, and he had a deep, weighty, stern message of rebuke for the children of Israel. He called out to them, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. You see, he was a preacher, and his message was full of they, 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 
sinful nation. They've gone back. They are forsaking the Lord. And they are not following after the Lord. Then all of a sudden, he saw a vision of the Lord and a vision of himself. The Lord showed him his heart. And he was a prophet. The Lord showed him his attitude. And he was a prophet. The Lord showed him his conversation. And he was a prophet. The Lord showed him the depravity, the carnality within. And he was a prophet. The Lord showed him how unqualified he was. And he was a prophet. The Lord showed him his uncleanness. And he was a prophet. We need a vision of ourselves. Not as people are promoting us, exalting us, exaggeration, exaggerating our gifts and our talents. We need a fresh vision of what our hearts look like. If I see sinners and I can never weep, I need a vision that will tell me and show me what my heart looks like. If I see, if I hear that, you know, so and so died, and I never ask myself the question, was he born again? I need a fresh vision of what's in my heart. If I hear that people die every minute, every moment, and I never tremble, and I never wonder what has happened to those people, I need a fresh vision of what my heart is before the Lord. If I can discuss about, you know, all these sinners, all these smokers, all these drunkards, and I can be light and frivolous about it, I need a vision of what my heart looks like. If I can see men and women coming to the church day in, day out, and I never get concerned whether they have been born again, all I want is that I want their offering. I want their cooperation in the church. I want this, I want this. I need a fresh vision of what my heart looks like before the Lord. If I can sit with my family at the table and talk about mundane things of the world and never talk about all the neighbors that are perishing, all the people that are going to hell, all the people that have no hope in Christ, and all I talk about is I saw this in the papers, I saw this in the other place, I hear this information, I hear this information, and we laugh about it, we never pray about it. We wonder about it, we never pray about it. We discuss about it, we never pray about it. I need a vision from the Lord of what my heart looks like. I pray the Lord will show us a vision of our hearts. As it is before the Lord, uh, when you see that vision, it will make you cry. It will make you go before the Lord. It will make you realize, woe is unto me. You see, before we see the vision of what we look like before the Lord, before that time, we will say, I'm a great prophet. I'm a great evangelist. I am so and so. You get a vision of God. You get a vision of God's sovereign people. You have a fresh vision of heaven and the glorified conquering Christ. And have the great vision of the ultimate collapse of earthly kingdoms. And a vision of the multitudes that are perishing on their way to hell. A vision of the judgment day. And above it all, a vision of your heart condition in the sight of God. You will shout and cry with Isaiah, Woe is unto me, for I am undone. Look at my heart. Look at my attitude. Look at my disposition. Look at my frivolity. Look at my unseriousness. Look at my dryness. Before the Lord, woe is unto me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. I pray that the heavenly visitor will come to visit you and bring the sanctifying fire from the throne of God and touch your heart and touch your lips and set your heart on fire set your lips on fire you will born for Christ everywhere you go your message will be burning in the hearts of the people because you will see like you have never seen before you will talk like you have never talked before the fire 
of God will be burning in your soul. And I pray that during this conference, all through this week, God will kindle a fire inside your heart. And that fire will never be blown out by the devil in Jesus' name. It was after the fire touched his lips, he heard the voice of the Lord. Verse 8. And also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Can he send us to do great work before we see the vision? I doubt it. Can he send us to the waiting multitude outside before we see the vision? I doubt it. Before we see the vision of God, vision of heaven, vision of the glorified Christ, vision of uh, the suffering people, vision of the ultimate collapse of the earth. If he sends us into the world, maybe we'll be looking at another thing because we've not seen that all these things are going to collapse. If we have not seen multitudes on their way to hell and the judgment day, and we have not seen ourselves in God's sight, can he send us to the multitude so we can do a great job? I doubt it very much. But then he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. You know, if he had not seen a vision, he would have said, Oh, whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? He will think that was a message for him to preach because he was already a prophet. He will say, I'm called already. I'm sent already. I'm preaching already. I'm praying for people already. I'm prophesying already. I'm working for God already. So that call that is coming now to a new kind of ministry, a new level of ministry, that can't be for me. I'm already an accomplished preacher. He'll be saying, well, I remember when I did this. I remember when I did this. But all of a sudden, because of the vision that Isaiah had seen, he acted as if he had never done anything before. And then he said, Lord... I know you, I'm the one you are calling. I thought before that I've started, but now I want to start. I thought before that I've been working for you. In fact, I've been rebuking the whole nation, telling them, ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity. In fact, I've been giving altar call before. Come now and let us reason together. But now I see that all I've done cannot stand in the face of this vision you have given me now. I will now start to work for you. I was almost getting tired. I was almost washing my nets. I was almost packing up. I was almost thinking that, well, this one that I've done now, I can now lay my sword down and then hand over to other people. But I see that I've not even started at all. Here am I. Sent me. And with that vision, we'll need the anointing from the Lord. Because, you know, it's not by might. It's not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. Let me plead with you for the sake of the multitudes that are perishing in this nation. Let me plead with you that this week you will pray like you have never prayed before. And you will tell him, give me a fresh vision and give me a fresh anointing. The Lord will give you a vision of himself. It may be in the day, it may be in the night, you will never be the same again. And then tell him to anoint you because it's by the anointing that the yoke is broken. He will pour his spirit upon you. And after this week, you will go not in the strength of your education, not in the strength of your ability, not in the strength of any mortal man or natural man. You will go in the strength of the Lord to go and do exploits for the Lord. Do not waste any time. Do not just move around and loiter around. Do not just make it a time of discussion and talking to other people. Anywhere you are, O oh Lord, show me a vision of yourself. At the beginning of every message, O oh Lord, I want to see you like I never saw you before. And during the message, O oh Lord, show me the thing you have reserved and preserved for me in your word, something that will make me to tick and kick that I will never be the same again. And in the hostel, make it a time of prayer and say, God, I want to be a giant for Christ. And I want to do exploits for the Lord. Show me thyself afresh. Give me anointing afresh. The Lord will meet with you. He will anoint you. He will empower you. 
And when you go back to where you came from, the people will know. In the year that King Uzziah died, you saw the Lord and the train filled the temple. They will know. The heavenly guest came and he touched your lips. Because you'll preach with burning coals of fire. And they will know that he has touched your heart. And every time you'll be going, your family will know that you have been called of God. Maybe they are doubting your call. After this conference, they will not doubt your call. They will know you are the servant of the Most High God. Whatever problem there is, whatever shortcoming there is, whatever deficiency there is, go before the Lord and say, God, this week, turn me all over. Give me a vision from above. Anoint me mightily so that I will do something for the glory of God in this generation. I believe it will happen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I am here for a purpose. I need a fresh vision from above. I need a fresh vision from above. And I need the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost upon my life. The Lord will call you afresh. And the Lord will equip you afresh. We need a fresh vision. We need a clear vision. And we need a mighty anointing upon our souls. Upon our spirit. So that from this place, we'll carry out an anointed ministry. Fresh vision, mighty anointing. Fresh vision with a mighty anointing. He will do it. You will never be the same again. Your ministry will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much because of your word unto us tonight. Lord, we praise your name because of the truth. It's clear to us that you have called us that you will give us a new vision. Lord, tonight, if we open our eyes to see afresh the men and women in their sins roaming about our environment. Lord, in your mercies, if we open our eyes to see afresh the judgment of God coming upon the sinners who die in their sins. Oh Lord, our eyes are opened to see ourselves, to see where we stand, to see the little we have done, and to see the much that lies ahead, the things we are called to do. Oh Lord, I pray, as we have seen of your glory, as we have seen of heaven, as we have seen the need around us, as we have seen your own judgment, Lord, we are asking that by your Spirit, through your word, this period, you stir us up. Oh Lord, as we are set up, you will send us out with the power of your spirit. 
and Lord, all were commanded to do by your word, we shall do for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we are believing that as we hear from you, O oh Lord, our lives, our ministries, our churches, we will not remain the same in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father in heaven, all the tools we need, all the power and power we need, all the grace we need, O oh Lord, you give unto us abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Mighty God, I am praying that we that are here will be hearers and doers of your word. O oh Lord, as we do your word, your word in us, your word through us, will be a foot in us in all our places in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, all that will hinder us all the tools of Satan, all the tools of his agents, Lord, we reject all of them. And Lord, we command that he will clear from our ways in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department.